And a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, welcome to our uh, updated live training on vulnerability uh, assessment and penetration testing. This is a new training for us. Really excited to share it with you. It's something that we've been working on all year. And uh, we are opening this service up to our clients. Uh, so pretty exciting times for us. Uh, and we've been um, aligning our business in this area for quite some time now. Uh, and uh, now it's time to share some of what we've been working on with you. So I'm joined here by Adrian, uh, who's the founder of Onsite Helper. Thanks for being here. Uh, also a head of security, Max, uh, who are going to be helping me to co-present this webinar. Uh, and uh, if you are here on the live, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you can ask questions using the Google Meet Q&A functionality, uh, and we'll be monitoring those as we go along. Uh, if, if the uh, chat isn't working right now, I can't ask you where you're from, but I usually love to ask you where you're watching from, uh, but that's okay. I'm sure we'll be able to catch up at some point in the future. Uh, my name is Pete Moriarty. Um, I'm the founder of IT Genius uh, and also now part owner in Onsite Helper. Uh, and um, I'm here to help uh, chaperone you for the next little while. So let's jump in. Um, we, uh, if you're new to us, um, we've built a significant Google partner uh, in Australia, and uh, we're now regarded as the top Google partner for Australia and New Zealand for small business, which is pretty exciting. Uh, both our um, brand, IT Genius, uh, which is a small business focused brand, and Onsite Helper, which is our medium business, um, our small to medium sized business focused brand, uh, are now premier partners, which is pretty cool. Only took 50 years for Google to. Uh, actually don us finally with the premier partner badge. Um, but uh, we we have about 25,000 uh, end users under management globally uh, across about 15 countries. Uh, and that's across about, uh, we have about 2,000 companies on our books under management. Um, and so we're all in on Google Workspace. Um, this is really our area of expertise. Um, but we, uh, both of our businesses actually started in the managed services world. Uh, and so that's uh, infrastructure, Microsoft, Active Directory. Uh, and so we've got a good idea of the landscape of um, overall small business infrastructure and how that plays into securing a small business's IT assets. Uh, we worked with some pretty exciting brands. Uh, these are um, IT Geniuses uh, clientele, some more clientele here from Onsite Helper as well. As well, uh, You probably recognize some of these brands, um, some of the quite prominent Australian brands, uh, and also lots of um, small businesses. Most of our customers on our books are small and medium-sized businesses, less than 100 employees. Uh, we've got plenty of customers that are bigger than that, but um, both of our businesses are primarily aimed at supporting uh, small business owners. Uh, and that's what we really, really love is working with small and medium-sized businesses. They tend to be founder-led or their family businesses or their small businesses that have grown up and got bigger. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're uh, that's what we're all about, and that's who we're here to support. So today, if you want to participate, uh, you can't jump in the chat, uh, but you can drop in a Q&A. So if you don't know where that is, it's right down in the bottom right hand corner of your Google Meet. Um, you can just click the little arrow and then go to activities, bit of a weird name for it. But if you go to activities, then you can jump into uh, Q and A and you can drop any questions that you have um, along uh, the uh, next hour into the Q and A. And uh, we will be here to stick around and answer as many questions as you have. Uh, but I do encourage you to share them as we go along because uh, if you want us to, uh, you know, re-explain something or, um, you know, go back and go over something again. If if you've got a question, please don't be shy to ask it uh, because in all likelihood, someone else will have the same or a similar question uh, if you're wondering about it. So uh, don't be shy, drop in any questions that you have as we go along. So what is it? Uh, VAPT, this uh, interesting acronym, this is, to be honest, a new one for me. Um, we were a small business. Uh, and we grew into a medium-sized business. We've now got about 60-ish staff across the group. Um, and things that I never thought I would have to deal with, I started to have to deal with at some point uh, in our business as we grew bigger and bigger. And this is something that we had to employ for our own business, which was um, you know, assessing what our vulnerabilities are and managing those risks. Uh, and then the actual active penetration testing of testing our internal systems. Um, and it's been an interesting process to go through for me because for a long time, I'd kind of go to bed at night, not with worry, but, you know, with the curiosity of had I done enough uh, to secure our business assets. And of course, 
being concerned about, am I doing enough to protect my customer's data and my customer's personal information? Because there's always this kind of like lingering feeling of, as a founder of a business, you know, what, what could be a showstopper? Out of all the scenarios, out of all the risks that we have, you know, what could be a showstopper for the business? And for a small or a medium-sized business, a data breach the size of somebody like Optus or the size of somebody like Medibank, um, which is, you know, a, a, a large uh, media-laden stuff up uh, and, and a very, very public issue. Uh, is something that could kill a smaller or medium-sized business. Um, and so when I go to bed at night and I worry about like what might be the showstoppers for our business, a serious data breach would be one of those showstoppers. And because the new laws have been introduced uh, around mandatory reporting, uh, around protection of people's um, personal information, that to me has just made all of this a whole lot more serious. Um, so we had to learn about um, assessing these vulnerabilities in a you know in a in a structured and professional manner, and then also going through the process of penetration testing as well. Um, and so, in part, what I'm going to be sharing is you know I guess what um, I had to develop internally. Um, but uh, you know, one of our businesses, Onsite Helper, built this discipline internally and started delivering it to clients. Um, and so that's what we're going to be sharing with you today is as much as we can to uh, you know educate you wherever you're at in business, whether you're an IT leader whether you're a business owner or business founder, um, or if you're someone who's just curious uh, about learning about IT security in this area, we're gonna share as much as we can for you. So here's what we're gonna be covering. Um, uh, some different areas where things need to be managed. Um, that's managing remote workers. Most of us are working remotely now, or at least in some kind of hybrid fashion. Uh, securing custom built applications, uh, which are most uh, one of the most common areas where there are vulnerabilities. Uh, number three is your public website and those vulnerabilities, very important for privacy. Uh, and then number four, you know, what our actual framework is for uh, VAPT. Uh, and so let's have a look at a bit of the landscape before we jump in. Um, cybersecurity threats are on the rise. Um, you know, 10 years ago, cyber insurance wasn't even something that was on my radar. Uh, and then, you know, all of a sudden, everything got very serious seemingly very quickly. Um, and you can see here that in the last five years, there's, uh, you know, nearly double um, uh, based on this report, uh, you know, cyber breaches uh, in businesses. And this is a, this is a global report. Um, and there's been some very high profile breaches that have happened as well. Uh, you know, from huge, huge brands, like we've got Toyota there, even Norton, who are a security brand, right? Um, and a lot of these are including, uh, unfortunately, ransoms. Uh, and we started seeing that, you know, I guess about a decade ago, ransomware appearing on computers. If you didn't have a good backup or disaster recovery plan, your business may be stopped for a week or for multiple weeks while you organize some Bitcoin and send some Bitcoin over to somebody in a, a you know foreign country somewhere and try and get your files decrypted again. Um, and, you know, that's really basically become a thriving industry for uh, for hackers and for those that want to get access to data uh, because they can get paid. Uh, this is the easiest way to get paid is to ask for a ransom. And uh, and unfortunately, the, the industry is very much thriving. And even though, yes, we can we can insure against it, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that your business and reputational damage will be fully compensated for um, because uh, that's what it's about, right? It's about your customers who may choose to do business with someone else if they can't do business with you because you're stopped uh, because of a ransomware attack uh, or they may just lose you know, faith or lose trust in you uh, and decide to shop elsewhere. Uh, now, this is especially important for small business owners uh, and small businesses. Uh, we are basically a target. Uh, SMEs are probably the easiest to break into because we don't have dedicated internal security teams. We, many of us, don't even have dedicated internal IT teams. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward to get access to a small business if the basics are not done of protecting from external threats. Uh, and to make things even worse, Australia has become a particular target. I think probably because we're like 98% small businesses, 98% uh, of all ABNs in Australia have less than 20 employees. Um, and so it's literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fertile ground if you're a uh, hacker or someone who wants to steal data. Um, and we've had our own uh, you know, pretty public breaches. Uh, I mentioned Optus and Medibank already. Um, this was another more recent one uh, in Victoria, uh, which was a uh, you know ransomware uh, group who decided to 
um, you know, attack a particular real estate agency and um, or network, sorry, and uh, they leaked quite a lot of data online um, after posting ransom. So pretty crazy stuff. Um, so how are we going to approach this uh, and, and what do we do about this? Um, well, let's jump into how we actually approach it. Um, now, before we get into the, the meat and potatoes, um, Adrian, uh, I'm curious, was there anything I missed on the um, uh, on the kind of landscape of where things are at at the moment? Um, you know, you've been working with businesses for many, many years, uh, particularly in the area of security. You know, what's your, what's your take on how things are changing at the moment? Yeah, thanks, Pete. No, I think you've covered it really well. I, I guess from my perspective, I do believe, you know, Australia is a really good target. You know, you did highlight some of the reasons uh, forth, but in particular, you know, Australia's had a really good econ economy over, you know, a number of years. So, and, and we're, and, you know, we've got more of a, I guess, a she'll be right type of attitude when it comes to implementing IT security. We're, we're very trusting, um, you know, much more than other other neighboring countries. So we're quite an easier target compared to other regions of the world. And that's why we've, we've you know, become one of the top 10, you know, targets for for the world for for cyber cyber attacks and in my opinion this is only going to be increasing as well as you know our economy grows and our businesses grow um you know the level of security that we've that you know when we onboard new customers uh, it, it's alarming you know their their level of security practices and policies that they've got in place you know we work hard to bring them up to a certain level but just just from what we've experienced um generally it's very rare that we, you know, we in, introduce to a new client there, and we're surprised that you know their level of security is quite high. It's it's usually you know quite low. So there's the, that overall, there's a lot of work to be done um, across all businesses in Australia, big and small. So um, yeah, that's that's my sort of take. Thank you. Um, speaking of alarming, I think it's a nice segue into remote worker security. Um, you know, anytime I think of BYOD or someone doing remote work i think of you know like in covid we're all forced to work from the kitchen table right and what's what's sitting on the kitchen table well, that's the home computer and quite often they don't have a password there's a million apps installed on them you know someone's let their their kids or their teenagers download whatever uh you know like pirated movies and that kind of thing uh who knows what's on that machine it probably doesn't even have a password uh and yet it's signing into your corporate google drive or email or anything else keystrokes could be being recorded passwords could be captured um and like i i i worry a lot about that because um uh you know for me it's it's fairly easy for us to um you know protect and lock down a cloud account you can throw on two-factor authentication you might set up uh you know a single sign-on um to authenticate centrally uh, we can easily lock down, <clears throat> excuse me, machines that are sitting in an office because we've got control of the hardware and control of the location, and we can have firewalls and whatnot set up. But as soon as you go to remote work and working from home, uh, you know all of that landscape changes because all of a sudden we don't have control of the hardware. And um, the next slide here has. Um, um, I'll, just, I'll just butt in, Pete, just just please. to sort of um, elaborate a bit more on that. I guess. From my perspective, I've really noticed that pre-pandemic, the security was generally pretty good in offices. And what's happened is, as a pandemic hit, um, a lot of businesses were forced to suddenly shift and, you know, they had to operate. So, you know, ne the next day, basically, they had to close their, you know, the doors to the office and everyone, the business had to keep running. So they had to really enable that to happen. And, and by doing that, they really, they haven't put much thought into security or had the time to implement it. And since then, they've really been on the back foot. So now, now all their data, you know, they had their local servers or data on the network or all secure previously, but they've had to really open it up to be able to operate, uh, and and even you know maybe getting external contractors on you know, different platforms to help sort of grow their business as well. But they haven't really invested heavily in securing all that data for all those remote workers, and I really do blame the pandemic of of rushing you know the process of. Of, of being able to work remotely when you know if, if it was up to it teams they would have you know slowly phased this in at a comfortable level but now we're sort of in this situation and we're kind of you know on the back foot now trying to secure all these remote connections and you know cyber criminals have found this a great opportunity and we've seen over the years that they've really leveraged 
um, to to get into people's home computers for an access to you know access to to the OneDrive or Google Drive, and now they've got a data breach via you know a home home computer that you know the children were using or, or whoever was using it downloaded something incorrectly. So um, yeah, it is a challenge now, but it's something we really need to work towards to yeah. to improve. So let's get uh, let's get into some of the tech. Um, so you know the actual challenges of remote work and and the technical vulnerabilities that they raise. Uh, Max, this is probably a good time to throw to you. Um, you know, tell us a bit about what you're seeing, particularly in the areas of remote work. So, um, hello guys. Um, so within uh, the areas of remote work, what people usually do is they have a personal computer and then they are like, you know, logging into various, you know, websites. They're using a lot of, you know, different kinds of you know, logins and then using the same kinds of passwords. And then, you know, it's kind of an easy way for attackers like get in to any of their corporate accounts as well. And especially, you know, installing any software that's, you know, out of, uh, you know, any of the corporate world or uh, the software that's not designed to be used in any of the offices, it's going to be really uh, one of the challenges in, you know, uh, using these kinds of software, like, you know, remote world as well, because this would eventually be leading, you know, one of the attackers to maybe, you know, have any kind of vulnerability within their devices or maybe one of their VPN servers, which is not, you know, configured properly. So uh, I think these are the most important things that, yeah. So I've got a curi curious question, Max. Um, do you think VPNs are mandatory these days? Yes, like for a remote worker, VPNs are mandatory, but uh, I'd say, you know, configured with good encryption and a lot of, you know, uh, design in mind. For example, you know, keeping uh, the context aware access and all of these things, I think it's mandatory to have, you know, VPNs in everyone's uh, personal computers. Yeah. Um, to me, um, you know, immediately I start to think of, okay, computer sitting in someone's lounge room uh, has Keylogger installed um, because it's pretty easy to get, um, you know, Keylogger type malware installed on a machine. Um, and then immediately, as you say, the shared passwords issue. Oh, okay, they use this password for their Facebook. It's probably the same for their work Google account. And then once someone's into the work Google account, very easy to impersonate that person, send an email to the boss. Hey, can you please send this payment to this supplier? Otherwise they're gonna cut us off. And you know, that like age old phishing attack happens and you know, the money goes to the wrong person. Um, so that that seems pretty, pretty simple um, there. Um, we've got, you know, a slide here, and, and we can't cover every single one of these um, now, but uh, these are the ways, and please feel free to take a screenshot of this um, and save this for later. We will send you the recording and all of the slides after, but if you want to take a screenshot, you're very welcome to. Um, these are all of our strategies for securing remote access. Uh, if you have any curiosity or if you'd like any of the like acronyms on this page uh, explained, just drop it right now into the Q&A in Google Meet. Um, just open up the activities menu, go to Q&A, uh, and just drop it in and we'd be happy to um, explain any of these if you have a particular curiosity that you'd like us to cover um but i think I'll just, probably um, oh yeah adrian go go ahead so just just on vpns um i'll just be interested to hear max's thoughts on a lot of businesses would have set up vpns they might have had a firewall router that can manage their vpn or they might have found like a vpn service online What's your viewpoint on VPN? How how secure are they? Uh, is like are all VPNs the same, or is is this a, like a is there a vulnerability? Can VPNs be hacked? What's what's your thoughts there, Max? Definitely. So, um, like any other technology that we use, VPNs are also vulnerable. And uh, in terms of using any kind of VPN, we need to ensure that the VPN is using the correct kind of encryption. For example, there are like you know uh, various kinds of encryption that any VPN is using. So if uh, a VPN is using the latest uh, industry-based standards to be encrypted, uh, you know, on both ends, then it's a good indication that we, we should be using that VPN. And there are like a couple of other factors as well that need to be, you know, checked. And then, you know, maybe uh, a VAPT should be done, uh, you know, on the network to ensure that uh, the VPN is actually secure. 
Yeah. Awesome. Good, Just uh, to, good call. Oh, that's fine. Thanks, Pete. Uh, we've got a, a question here on VPNs from Renee, uh, and I just posted that in the uh, in the chat for you guys to handle. Uh, that is VPNs for compu uh, personal computer logins. Understand this? Uh, can you talk about work computers that staff use for work purposes? Uh, they're unable to download software without admin assistance, and we have two-factor authentication set up. Um, I presume the question is, you know, like is that enough? Um, you know, if it's a company-issued machine. Um, and uh, you know the the downloads the downloads are currently protected. Um, I assume by some kind of endpoint protection currently. Yep. Uh, so to answer that, so for example, um, if the computer is within the office premises, then I think it's safe enough. But it needs to be protected by some sort of firewall, maybe any kind of you know internal firewall that's there. Then it's uh, it's fairly you know. Uh, protected and then we can assume that you know we don't need any VPN but if the office computer is taken anywhere maybe you know people travel around the world to you know uh, with their uh, corporate computers as well and then you know if uh, they're able to you know log in in any of the public Wi-Fi's then you know it's it's gonna be a risk so I definitely uh, suggest using VPNs on that specific case or maybe you know using um, uh, the corporate office, uh, you know, network, like, you know, it's going to be safer if you have a VPN as well. But yeah, it just, uh, yeah. yeah. I think with, uh, especially with um, Wi-Fi in public places, there's a thing called man in the middle hacking, where you think you're connecting to the Wi-Fi of the hotel or the airport, but it's actually someone else's router and, and all your information is getting routed via their computer. And they're basically collecting all your login information. If you're opening up any browser and it's sending a, and, and the, that particular thing doesn't have the right security encryption, like you're logging into Gmail, or maybe not Gmail, but any other type of site, that they can actually see your passwords as you log in. They can collect that information as well. So that's where VPN will stop that. Um, you know, those man in the middle hackings from public Wi Fi in particular. Uh, one of my favorite things uh, to do once a VPN has been set up, particularly where you've got a geographically um, distributed team, is if the VPN has a central IP address that the traffic is being routed through, you can start to lock down access to your cloud-based tools just to that VPN-based IP. Um, and so that's really, really useful. So if even if someone's account was compromised and their username and password, if all of that was compromised, Obviously, not if the VPN was compromised, but if someone's credentials, uh, base credentials were compromised, um, then you know the second layer of protection uh, would be the IP address that they connect your tools with, and that would be for something like really important, like billing. Um, you know, you would want to make sure that you have that uh, locked down to a certain set of IP addresses that uh, that can access. Um, I'd like to move on here, but I think it's important to make an honourable mention for Chrome OS devices here. Uh, Chrome OS really helps to solve a lot of problems uh, with remote access. Uh, when you've got an operating system that's uh, pretty much completely locked down to a Google account, if you're already using Google Workspace, that's great. Um, you can actually connect them to uh, Active Directory these days if you're using that for your primary directory. Um, but uh, yeah, Chromebooks, Chrome devices will effectively solve a lot of the challenges because um, they're locked down to a particular account. Uh, and that endpoint management and endpoint security is is managed on those machines, which is very cool. Okay, cool. Uh, Renee said, thank you for answering the question. No worries, Renee. Uh, happy to handle that. Okay, uh, so let's move on then to securing custom-built applications. Uh, and to be honest, this is the one that gives me the heebie-jeebies, uh, probably more than any. Uh, I did say that about remote work, but I remember that this one is even more uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, I, I think because I'm not a web developer, um, and so, you know, I don't really, I don't really know what I don't know about, um, you know, web security and securing a, uh, you know, Apache web server and, you know, oh, what PHP exploits might be available in, uh, you know, this file sitting on a publicly accessible website potentially. Um, and so, Max, I'm going to throw to this one, uh, throw this one to you again. Uh, yeah, tell us a bit about custom apps and and we where we find issues there. Yep. So let's start with. Uh what we usually do for example um for any company that decides to you know develop a website decides to host a website they have a developer usually usually working on it 
And uh, the primary, you know, goal of a developer is to make, you know, the functionality work. And sometimes, and you know, in like 80% of uh, the websites I've seen, they're mostly, you know, not focused on security because that's not the uh, main part of what they usually do. And that, you know, usually leaves a vulnerable, you know, hole within the website. And that is how any attacker is able to, you know, uh, use that vulnerability to get, you know, into the website. And then they are able to install any of their malicious scripts. And that is how they, you know, take control of the whole website. And what it leads to is, you know, um, any customer or anyone who's, uh, you know, trying to input in any of the forms within the website they will be able to take in all of the data, for example, maybe credit card data, any personally, you know, identifiable information as well. And then, you know, they're able to do so much from it. And even, you know, it gets to a point where uh, the main company, they, they're they able to, you know, uh, send out emails from the same website because they've linked, you know, some APIs in so, some sort of way, and they're able to impersonate uh, the CEO and then, you know, send out emails, phishing campaigns, and all of that. So it just happens from one That's single point. Um, sorry, Max. Just with the um, actual applications, though, what what sort of uh, common application services might be running that we might see? Like, I mean, you know, for instance, like they might create their own CRM in some cases or a billing system um, that helps their, support their business. What are sort of the vulnerabilities around sort of the custom built applications and, you know, what, what, is, yeah, what are the applications that we see and how they get into those and what do they do? So um, from what my experience is and what my team has done, uh, I think um, uh, mostly JavaScript is what uh, many developers use. And many plugins from WordPress and you know Drupal and all of these sites are used. And one of the leading uh, you know vulnerable factors is that they are not you know looked into once the site is set up. There's no changes to that, no monitoring, no change, you know, no security reviews, and that is what it leads to you know having uh, any site being you know taken over by an attacker and. Uh, it's mostly, you know, commonly WordPress for the sixty percent of the sites that's being yeah. used. And I, and I think um, these are really good targets for cyber criminals as well, because if they can if they can infiltrate your, you know, for instance, you've got a database of all of your customer information. Um, you know, that's kind of like their gold mine. As soon as they get access to that database, they're going to email you and let you know, hey, we've got all your customers' data here. Um, you got. You got two options: either you pay us a lot of money, and we'll give it back to you, and nothing's going to happen. Or option two is we're going to release this on the dark web, and give all cyber criminals access to this, and then you have to, you know, do, go down the whole path of notifying a data breach and letting all your customers know. It's going to be a big headache for you. So, either pay us or, or have a very hard time. So, it's a quick way that they can get money, and that's you know, as soon as they they breach one of these databases, that's like, oh, well, this is payday for us. And they do, a lot of times people will pay out the money rather than going through the headache of, of having to declare a data breach and potentially lose their customers uh, because of that. So, yeah, that's, that's my bit. I think we can move on to the next one, Pete. Yeah, uh, I think in, in one in one moment, because I, I want to take one pause and uh, I guess like share a story of how we went wrong in this area. Um, so I think for these uh as far as what i see in small businesses and and you know by small business i mean like you know less than less than 20 employees if you're a really small business you you know you probably haven't built your own custom crm system from the ground up although some do uh you know it's not all that common um but what is more likely to be common is you've got uh you know one app from a vendor or from a supplier and you've employed either a tech person or a contractor or someone on um, Upwork or Odesk or Fiverr to build a little connector app. Um, you know, maybe there's a little script that runs, um, you know, maybe it's grabbing some bit of information from one API and it's pushing it over to another API. Um, they're the kind of things where, as Max said, someone will set it up and then 
basically forget about it. Uh, you know, as long as it's working, no one worries about it. And then what happens is after a couple of years, that staff person cycles out. Uh, and so no one knows how it works. And we have these apps in our business, which is why I can talk about this intimately, uh, you know, that have been set up five or 10 years ago. And, you know, it's just a little script that's just kind of running there. Now, um, the danger with those, and we found this out the hard way, was one of our uh, junior developers on our team uh, uploaded a uh, script or it was something, but it went up to GitHub um, and it was actually published with a set of credentials publicly. And hackers very quickly got access to that uh, and they were able to access our Google Cloud account or one of our Google Cloud accounts. And they started spinning up virtual machines to mine Bitcoin. And as those machines were spun up, I was getting these text messages on my phone and it was saying 10,000 has been spent on your Amex. And then an hour later, 10,000 has been spent on your Amex. And then an hour later, 10,000 has been spent on your Amex. And I thought, oh, that's funny. Amex's text messaging system must be broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> and it was only after like after a day that I I called my CFO and I was like, hey, you know, something something kind of weird kind of weird is going on. Anyway, they'd burnt through one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in twenty four hours, <laughs> uh, and and you know, like that's that's pretty crazy, right? And and you know, we were lucky that after a number of weeks, we were able to negotiate with Google to uh, have that money credited to our account. And I think it's only because we were a Google partner that they were kind enough to do that. Um, but effectively, effectively, we were up shit creek for 120 grand uh, in 24 hours. Like it happened so quickly without even knowing uh, what was going on. Um, and so these these custom apps, these are the ones that, um, that as I said, give me the heebie-jeebies. Um, so how can, we, how can we protect these and, and what can we do about it? Oh, and it's honorable mention here as well for Optus, it was a publicly, it was a publicly exposed API um, that Optus uh, had exploited last year. Um, so I'm sure everyone's heard of the Optus breach uh, last year and uh, it was an API that was left open. Um, uh, and so these, you know, these are the kind of things that um, a technical business owner in a medium-sized business is probably not going to know what to look for unless you're a computer engineer. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm I consider myself to be pretty techy. I can code HTML, uh, but this is this is beyond me. Um, and um, you know, it, it, we've we've even been you know hit with our own vulnerabilities as well. Okay, so what do we do about it? Again, if you'd like to take a screenshot, very welcome to take a screenshot. Uh, let's talk about the best practices. Like, how do you fix it? How do you manage these? Uh, Max, I think we'll throw to you for this. Yep. Um, so, from what we've done in the past, and then what you know, uh, clients have done to secure their apps is number one, doing regular VAPT audits. That is how we are able to you know understand what kind of process the app is like doing. For example, we do like static and dynamic analysis as well, like both of them. For example, uh, on the static part, we just look at what's being exposed on the cloud. And then uh, for the dynamic part, we see the functionality as well, along with the security. And uh, using uh, a, a, you know, uh, a series of methods that we are going to um, explain in the later slides, uh, we're definitely able to you know, get through most of the security issues through this. Otherwise, you know, initially, uh, daring to secure coding practices is one of the best ones, you know, having all of those security things in mind before developing any app. It's going to be the best way to, you know, uh, patch and then make sure that there there's no vulnerable loopholes in the uh, third-party apps. Yeah, Adrian, is there anything that you wanted to add? Uh, no, that's all covered well. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think the the key thing for me when going through this process internally, the VAPT process, was even creating a a register of assets. Uh, you know every technical asset in the business like as a as a small business we you know without a dedicated cio or cto we had just kind of left this up to people's memory and a bit of an idea and some people knew some tools and some people knew others uh, but when we created an actual asset register of everything it allowed us to have uh you know one common place where we knew okay anything that needs to be checked or updated uh is on that list uh, and if we generate a new IT asset that could potentially be a vulnerability, it now goes on the asset list. Uh, and so that's then, uh, you know, some at least form of management. So things don't get just, you know, forgotten that old script from 10 years ago just kind of gets left out there running. Uh, 
Cool. So there's a question that's come through from Roman. Um, we have Google Cloud plus GitHub advanced security for our custom apps. Uh, but for sure, I relate to being worried that it's not enough. Um, yeah, I don't know. If, uh, kind of not a question, more a comment. But um, yeah, if you guys want to, I don't know. Do you have any comment on that, Adrian or Max? Yep. Um, from what I think is, he uh, Roman must have had a VM on Google Cloud. And then uh, he's using some sort of pipeline to uh, implement the code, uh, if I'm not wrong. And I definitely think you know uh, it's one of uh, the major things that developers do. They integrate different kinds of platforms together. And you know, in between, there might be a loophole somewhere. And um, yeah, definitely, uh, there, there should be a VAPT check in order to you know, find out if there's any. Uh, I definitely think it should be done. Yeah, and this is really the practice, right? It's um, you know, it's it's testing. Okay, cool. Quick energy check. I'm going to say uh, to everyone just to give yourself a stretch, move your body a little bit. Uh, we've been going for uh, for nearly forty minutes now, so uh, have a bit of a breath. All right, cool. Um, let's jump into website vulnerabilities. Um, I know I want to get into our testing process. Uh, we already touched on WordPress a little bit, um, but the most important thing. Uh, here, when it comes to uh, website, and uh, Adrian, I know you want to jump in here. I'm going to throw to you in a moment. Uh, is I learned recently that any anyone who collects data, whether that be email addresses for a newsletter, whether that be customer inquiries with first name, last name, um, you know, email uh, on a website on a public website, that's effectively considered collecting personal information. And hashtag I'm not a lawyer, uh, but then falls under Privacy Act and all the other regulations and all the other mandatory reporting requirements. Um, and so, therefore, that means that pretty much every single person who has a website, a publicly facing website, if you've got some kind of lead form on there, uh, it is very important that you make your website a high priority for making sure it's protected. Uh, because if you've got database tables in there and you've got years and years and years of customer prospect inquiries, uh, or people signing up to your newsletter, you may fall within the thresholds of reportability and the large fines if there is a breach of those. Um, and so, yeah, Adrian, I want to hand to you to talk, um, you know, a bit more about, you know, if you're collecting payments and that kind of thing, because um, I know this one is uh, an important one to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've covered it well, Pete. Um, if there is some type of database um, that collects all that information, that's another little goldmine for cyber criminals to get access to, and then. You know, threatened to hold you know payments to to not release that. But another one which people aren't aware of is sometimes um, the cyber criminals will actually be a bit uh, mischievous and they'll they'll set up code um, to send a copy of all all forms to their own account. So they might have set this up you know yesterday or, or many years ago. So basically, every time someone fills in any bit of information on filling in a form. They basically get a copy of that and they could collect this information over years so you might think oh, i'm not i don't have any database but actually they're building up a database over years and and you weren't actually aware of this particular code which they modified in your website to slowly um <laughs> build up their own database based on all of your form inquiries um so that's, that's, that's terrifying <laughs> yeah so it's definitely worthwhile you know if you do have any as pete mentioned and any if, if if people punch anything on the keyboard when they're on your website to log into anything or Fill in a contact form or subscribe to a newsletter. Any any type of information which is pushed in, um, you know, you definitely need to get that reviewed. Um, and especially, you know, if you've got an e-commerce website, that's that's a no-brainer. You know, if you collect any credit card payments, ideally you're going through a payment gateway, so no credit cards are stored on on file. But if there are, then you know, you definitely need to have, you know be PCI compliant and have all that um, regularly checked um, with the APT as well. Yeah. So let's move on to um, weak points on a website. Uh, and yeah, let's talk about WordPress. Uh, I'd say that every single person who's got WordPress installed on their site uh, is probably not regularly updating it. Uh, it's one of those things that just gets, you know, missed. Um, and I know even for us, you know, we're, we're quite a large business now. We've got 60 employees. Like we still don't have a dedicated full-time web developer internally. Um, so it's still, you know, the job of somebody to check and we don't have perfect processes uh, making sure that everything is always up to date or that, um, you know, the the backups always run on time for the website. Um, but the the biggest one is that with any 
website where you're introducing plugins, all of a sudden you're introducing uh, you know, multiple potential complexities with third-party developers who may have their own exploits potentially that they don't even know uh, in the software that they've built. Uh, and also because plugins are sometimes built and then just left, uh, quite often they can you know, get out of date and then start to have vulnerabilities exposed with them. Or maybe one plugin changes how another plugin works inadvertently and it opens up security holes as well. Um, and so I, I think there's a pretty, uh, pretty big risk there to focus on uh, in web particularly. And um, you know, Max, I might throw to you to talk you know, more broadly about uh, you know, web protection in general. Maybe I mean Pete, you've covered points two and three very thoroughly there. I'd like to hear about what is what is SQL injection and just I don't think a lot of people will know about that. Can you can you give us a brief brief summary on that, Max? Yep. So um, SQL injection like uh, is something that is uh, a kind of script that an attacker you know inputs on the website and it is able to directly access the database of that specific website. Uh, for example, if there's like WordPress and then it's uh, vulnerable to uh, the SQL injection, then the attacker will be able to, you know, just take a look at anything that's stored within the WordPress website, including the passwords, although the passwords are hashed. But, you know, if uh, a weaker password is used, then, you know, they'll, they'll definitely be uh, able to know through different techniques, for example, rainbow tab tables and then, you know, anything that's already on the web. So it's one of the ways to get into the database without even logging in. Cool, thanks Max. Yeah, and the hosting of, let's say, cPanel, even if you have a VPS, like even if you're paying for a private server, it's probably worse because it probably doesn't have the protection of, of, of you know, shared hosting security protocols. But if you've just got a website sitting on a, on a you know, MySQL, PHP uh, server, then, uh, that's particularly vulnerable um, because you're just offering your website up to the world for people to pen test it themselves <laughs> effectively. Uh, it's a little bit better if you're running on Amazon or Google or you've got Cloudflare in front of it because uh, of you know web application firewall or um, you know the 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 basic penetration protection that you get from, um a vm or a um you know or an app instance on aws or on google cloud is going to be better than just a you know vps with a hosting company um but your actual website itself if it's php, PHP based or um you know or sql based there's um yeah there's there's pretty common ways to get into that pretty easily okay uh so another honorable mention here cash app uh this was uh, this was was it an SQL injection on this one? Um, I know it's related to website. Um, it it was from one of the employees. He oh, discovered wow. one of the uh, you know vulnerabilities within the website, and then you know used it later after he left the company. So you know oh, yeah. he just got the information and then yeah, was able to exploit it. Yeah, and so that comes down to technical onboarding and offboarding of employees um you know when you have your onboarding and offboarding process documented uh, are you doing things like recycling passwords that someone may have had access to in plain text um are you ensuring there is a list of every application that staff may have been granted access to and are they removed from every one of those apps because uh, you know every time i log into wordpress I seem to see, oh, there's an old employee who hasn't worked for us for six months. They're still listed as an administrator on our WordPress site. Uh, and, you know, we've got single sign-on, so it's a little bit safer, but, uh, you know, there's there's still points, uh, points of entry there, potentially. Uh, cool, okay, so uh, web security checklist. Um, this is another one to take a screenshot, on, uh, screenshot of if you like. This is the best practice uh, checklist. Um, uh, you can see there web application firewalls. I mentioned that earlier, strong passwords. Uh, that one's uh, pretty obvious, but uh, by now I expect everybody, if you're taking security seriously, you should be using a service like LastPass uh, that's gonna give you unique passwords for everything you're accessing and uh, encouraging and training your team to do the same as well. Uh, that's, uh, that's very important. Okay, so let's talk about um, the actual process um, of vulnerability and penetration testing and how we actually do that. Uh, Max is going to give you uh, the limelight for a bit here. 
Um, this falls under the framework of Essential 8. Uh, we've done a number of webinars uh, where we talk about the Essential 8 framework, uh, which if you're based in Australia, this is effectively the best practice framework that the Australian government has developed uh, to help businesses tackle cybersecurity and information security. Um, and so this falls within uh, these two uh, categories, patching applications, patching operating systems. Um, and uh, there is a, this is not a requirement. This is effectively, you know, a guideline of best practice that's been developed. Um, but VAPT sits under uh, what's expected as best practice um, for making sure that you're securing applications and also services as well. So VAPT, we're doing an assessment. Uh, and we're cataloging uh, assets and we're looking at, okay, what are the potential weaknesses? Um, and then the PT part is the actual testing. Uh, we actually see, okay, let's uh, ethically run some tools and see if we can break through the walls that have been set up currently. Uh, how'd I go with that, Max? Did I know, did I get that one right? That was 100% correct. <laughs> Great. I work, I, work that, on, I, work uh, go, Adrian. I think uh, in our experience, you do get quite a lot of uh, internal IT and sort of IT teams doing vulnerability assessment to some sort of level. Um, very rare we see penetration testing there. That's kind of um, that's really the the point of proof to know you know how good is your your security. You know have 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 an external security company come and try break in, and if you know that's that's going to show how good it is, right? And you'd much rather you know, a trusted source break into your your network rather than uh, you know, a cyber criminal, which might be even inevitable one day. Yeah, and and that that's a nice little segue because it gave me a bit of a heebie-jeebie uh, when uh, when we first started engaging this this process ourselves. Um, and so probably a good time to talk about like you know where is the where is the line uh, of of ethics with this, uh, and you know like what's you know what's the difference because effectively like. Adrian came to me about a year ago and said, hey, I've hired a hacker for the business. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> great. Uh, so yeah, Max, maybe you can share a bit about, um, yeah, a bit about this. Yep, so uh, the line with, where, where you like explain is you know, where ethics come in. For example, any attacker is able to do anything he wants, does run any tools he wants, you know, does uh, affect the CIA triad, which is the confidentiality, the availability, and you know the integrity of the whole infrastructure, or any site or any application. So what a hacker does is he does have you know intentions of gaining money, maybe gaining fame or popularity. And for a pen tester, his ethical, he just wants you know fix sites, make things secure, and using you know the same techniques that a hacker does. In an ethical way and in a safe way, not to harm anything, a pen tester is able to, you know, gather all of the information around the vulnerable parts and then is able to help fix these as well. On the other hand, the hacker is able to, you know, utilize them for his own good and then benefit. Cool. Thank you. So it's kind of like white hat and black hat. You know, we yep, use those exactly. terms in, in SEO. Yeah. Um, Cool. So let's uh, let's look at the actual process and what that looks like. Uh, there's four stages here: uh, assessment, uh, scanning, the actual testing, and then um, very important reports and recommendations uh, as the uh, you know the due diligence follow up. Um, so uh, take us through it, Max. Yep. So for the first stage, the initial assessment, what we uh, usually do is we take a note of what is running in on the server, or maybe you know, for example, if we have the scope of our website. We get the domain details. We'd be able to, you know, see what is running on. The, for, for example, you know, uh, the version of the Apache server, uh, what version of PHP it's running on, the version of WordPress, any plugins that are installed, like in the example that's listed here, and we'd be able to, you know, enlist all of these versions there. And uh, what we usually do is on the surface level would be able to see you know which of these versions are vulnerable to any of the tests that we do and it's going to be really deep all of the tests that are done is in line with the industry standards as well and this is able to you know uh, help us understand what the website is you know uh, having and then what the functionalities are as well all right awesome so 
stage two and and, th and this like you're not trying to break in with anything at this point so you might be doing like some external scanning at this point yeah. but not exactly. yet not yet trying to break in right so there's no exactly. there's no risk of like you know taking a website down because you're you know throwing too much traffic at it or anything no it's it's even like passive you know it's something that's yeah. collected over the you know time and then we are able to like see all of those details maybe stored somewhere on the internet you know or the history right. or something cool okay stage two so this is where we are able to like see actual vulnerable sections uh, within any of the you know application, maybe even the hardware as well. For uh, for the assessment, it actually reveals you know any kind of vulnerabilities. For example, uh, in the previous section, I mentioned about the Media Library Assistant plugin for the WordPress. It was actually vulnerable to remote code execution, which means any attacker is able to execute code on the server. And what this does is it leads the you know it gives the attacker full access to the server, which means he can you know upload any anything, any scripts, any plugins, anything you know he wants, and then it grants like full access uh, to the website and even the server, and which means he is able to like you know uh, change anything there. For example, uh, if there's like a credit card detail that's being stored, he's able to you know maybe forward all of the details to his own server. Without even letting the initial, you know, owner know, everything's working fine. But there's something that the attacker added, and he's able to, you know, uh, send all of the details to his server, and then, you know, no one knows it. It's it's so discreet as well. Uh, uh, the the next uh, stage would be uh, verifying if the actual vulnerability, uh, you know. Uh, exist using various manual methods as well and we'd be using tools and then our manual scripts that we create it could be anything you know it just depends on what the vulnerable item is and then we'd be using maybe a pre-made script or maybe something that we uh, create uh, using python or maybe javascript or anything and then uh, be able to you know actually understand that the the vulnerability is actually there yeah, thank you. Um, I think for me, uh, the the largest concern for me is, you know, Adrian, what you described is someone gaining access, but then, you know, we don't know about it, and they've just kind of like, you know, planted planted themselves as a seed that can just continue to gather information over time, um, and you know, the worst case scenario in that is that hacker comes to you and they say, yep. We've got all your customers' details. Uh, you know, we're going to start attacking your customers unless you pay us a ransom. If you pay a ransom, there's no guarantee. It's like you know, negotiating with a terrorist. Like, there's no guarantee that they they won't do it anyway, or that they won't ask for more. Uh, and that's a very very challenging position to be in from a negotiation standpoint, uh, is when someone else has all the power. The interesting part of I've, I've recently learned, Pete, is um, when cyber criminals get access to your email, in particular. They'll look. One of the first things I'll look for is your cybersecurity insurance policy, and they'll find out how much you're insured up to, and they'll set the ransom at that amount. So often it'll be like you know, half a million dollars. I'm like, here you go. Just your cyber insurance company is going to pay that out. So wow. they they're, they're really clever on that to to quickly get money, and you know they might add a bit on top, but yeah, that they yeah, they're all on, onto that. So yeah, yeah. that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, stage three, and uh, I'm I'm mindful of uh, time, so um, we're going to get everyone out of here uh, with a with a couple of minutes, uh, just a couple of minutes over. But uh, we'll uh, we'll have everyone wrapped up soon. Uh, Max, yep. so this phase is where we exploit the actual vulnerabilities, and then it is when we are able to you know gather all of the proofs as well on how an actual attacker is able to do. So this would be using any of the tools to actually exploit. But you know, if uh, the exploit is you know harming or like doing anything bad to the server or like the website, then we'd be notifying it because we're eth ethical, right? So uh, using those specific uh, safe tools would be able to show them that this actually works, and then uh, we'd be moving on to the next step of fixing it or maybe you know talking to the developer. Yeah. But, so let's, yeah. let's talk about that stage four. Yep. So uh, once that is done, we gather all, all of the proofs. We have screenshots of everything that uh, was done as part of the VAPT, the whole process. 
and it would uh, be you know separated into two specific sections the executive summary where you know it's designed for like high level people they will be able to like see what kind of what kinds of uh, you know risks they are like facing and then there's the detailed summary of everything that was done you know by the by the ethical hacker like in order to you know work on all of this a team of security experts will be doing all of this and you know uh, it, it's going to be really detailed cool i like that i like that there's the the transparency of like what's been done because um you know for me as like a pretty technical person uh i get a bit uncomfortable with somebody else you know penetration testing systems that i've set up <laughs> uh and so that's uh you know like hey here's what was done here's you know what method is there because i'm also interested to learn and for me you know to want to know how can i how can i better protect the systems um you know for my business being that i'm in a technical role uh in the business or pseudo pseudo technical role i just kind of get lumped with it um so thank you thanks very much for explaining that max um that that all makes sense um as we as we close out um we do have an opportunity to work with us and i'm going to share that in a moment um but i think it's important for us to make the point that um there's two options for you to approach this if you're in a business leadership position you can um you know make use of these strategies internally uh, and we've you know hopefully given you great direction on uh, how to approach them and what kind of areas to look for um but uh external really has some particular benefits uh in that um you're you're looking uh well I, you know when you're internal you're you're looking for things you're looking for vulnerabilities in systems that you may have configured yourself or set up yourself and the challenge with that is you don't know what blind spots that you may have or you don't know what blind spots your team may have um and so hence an external party working on this are going to be as they're getting to know the systems because they're going to be seeing your technology systems for the first time uh, they're going to come with more of a curiosity uh, and, you know, more than likely going to, uh, you know, find things that an internal team may not. Um, and so, and, you know, the reason why this exists and the reason why, the, you know, this, this is a service that is typically performed externally uh, is for that reason itself. You know, you're not, you're not audited uh, internally. You may have an internal person who looks after your books, but you're audited externally by an accountant to double check on things uh, and you know for someone to know what to look for uh, it's highly unlikely that you're going to have an ongoing malicious actor internally inside the business uh, but you will absolutely have uh, areas of the business where someone just hasn't thought of uh, or you know because of their competency has maybe missed um, or uh, you know because of the latest updates to technology or uh, you know industry standards around actual hacking methods unless you've employed your own internal hacker then uh, you know you're probably not going to have someone who's actually up to speed on what vulnerabilities are available or at least the full scope of vulnerabilities that are available um i think so one other one other yeah, point is, um, this is very time consuming so you have probably set objectives for your IT team to do certain things throughout the year to reach certain goals. If you lump them with something like this task, that's really going to delay those objectives. So you're probably not, you're probably not going to achieve your own sort of business objectives. Um, so having an external, you know, you can have a third party, do all this testing, find all the vulnerabilities, work with your IT team to help implement them, but you're not going to really distract them for you know, three or three months or so away from their current projects. Um, so you, the business can continuously grow, you know, with the help of your IT team. So yeah, that's, that's the other part to it as well. Great. Um, so we've got a couple of comments here that I'll cover. Um, Elizabeth said, thank you for sharing this important information. You're very welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, Renee has asked, do you have a recommendation for someone to do this VAPT? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Yes, in <laughs> indeed we do. Uh, so here's, here's how we can help. Um, we have an offer to work with us, um, to, uh, build this, uh, for, well, to deliver this for your business. Um, and so we actually have a, a team of certified professionals in this area uh, and on-site helper can deliver this for your business uh, right through all of those stages from the assessment um, to the, you know, cataloging the assets uh, right through to the actual delivery of the testing and then the reporting and the recommendations as well. Um, and so Max is our, uh, is our head of security uh, and has been employed to lead and build this team. Um, and uh, yeah, very, happy with how that's been happening and we've been delivering this now for businesses uh, and getting some uh, you know some great results the uh, offer that we have today if you're interested in um, getting your toes in the water um, obviously a 
a full scope of um, you know testing and measuring uh, each different technology system inside your business uh, will be something that we need to quote on um, you know based on how many systems you have and the complexity of those systems uh, and so that you know would be a variable cost um, that we can have a conversation about and work that out with you free consultation you're not going to get the hard sell uh, we'll just have a, a you know chat with you about how we can approach that uh, but if you would like to get started today with just the basics to dip your toes in the water um, we recommend absolutely every person to do this at a bare bare minimum uh, and that's through your website vulnerability assessment uh, and so that's a 61 point vulnerability assessment for your website um, you would have noticed that this was one of the key categories if you're running wordpress uh, if you're running on a, um, you know, which most people are, a public server, uh, whether it's a VPS or whether it's a shared services, um, there are potential vulnerabilities there. Uh, even if it's running on Google or on AWS, so particularly if you've set it up internally, uh, that's something that you certainly want to have uh, managed and uh, reviewed. Uh, we have our offer here. It's uh, usually priced at nearly double that. Um, and uh, let me drop the link. Uh, I've got a URL in here. Hold on, let me just grab that URL. Uh, and I'm going to drop that into the chat. Now, I'm not sure if everyone can actually see the chat, but if you want to take a screenshot or write this down, uh, onsitehelper.com forward slash VAPT dash offer. Uh, and um, and I'll, come, I'll come back to that one, come back to that one as well. Now, there's a few different uh, reports or tests or um, you know types of VAPT that we can actually do. Uh, and that's why I recommended uh, if you're interested in us looking at the full scope, uh, jump onto a consultation with our team uh, because we can look at if you want to focus on remote work and how your remote team are working and their devices and their hardware and their connections or you're considering setting up a VPN um, you know, as a strategy, that would be uh, one to look at, the remote work assessment. Uh, if you've got a custom built app or you've got an off-the-shelf app that's self-hosted, uh, you know, maybe it's commercial software, but you've hosted it yourself, that would still count as a custom built app uh, and that would need its own review. Um, you know, if you've got, um, you know, hardware like Active Directory, Microsoft infrastructure, um, uh, any of that kind of like more, you know, traditional localized IT infrastructure, um, we have a particular set of tests around that. Um, and then if you have published a mobile app as well, Android or iOS, uh, we can look into that. Um, if you want to do the whole lot, obviously have a chat to us uh, and we'll work out a plan for you. If you want to do some of these over time, uh, you know, maybe you choose to do one per quarter on a cycle. Um, you know, maybe you want to build this into like a once a year type testing frequency. Uh, these are um, assessments that we can do as we get to know your business. Uh, we can start to build these into the systems and the processes. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, it should go without saying, but our team of certified professionals, uh, certified ethical hackers, um, and um, yeah, we've basically got a lot of the the industry uh, certifications for these, which is something your internal team probably won't have. Uh, your internal team may be able to follow the principles um, of how these processes work, uh, but the actual certifications and you know, when someone geeks out about this, uh, you know they're going to be um, the person who's going to go the extra mile um, to actually deliver it. Um, and so that's why our recommendation is to go external. We'd love to work with you uh, if you're interested in working with us. Um, and a few of our customers who have given feedback on, uh, pro on uh, us delivering this service to them, um, uh, particularly working uh, with Max as our head of security here. Um, yeah, some people will come to us after a hack. It's you know the same basket as someone who comes to us to set up a backup after they've lost data. <laughs> uh, you know, we can only say so many times that this should be done before you have an incident. Some people need to learn the hard way. Uh, but if you're at all curious, um, yeah, please jump on, have a have a chat with us. Um, there's there's no uh, there's no hard sell on the consultation. Uh, you know, we'll just get an idea of how important this is to you and your priorities, and get an idea of uh, how we can work together on this if you would like to. Finally, the uh, fines and the penalties have just been upped by the Australian government. They're getting really really serious about this. It's now up to fifty million dollars penalty, um, and if the uh, breach is big enough, I presume they're not going to just go after the company. They're probably going to be implicating at the very least directors, if not potentially key staff. I, I don't know if they go for that level of overreach, but I guess it depends, um, you know, how bad it is. So, um, yeah, triple profit penalties, that's the kind of thing that could cripple a small business. 
um, or small or medium sized business. Not many people have that much money kind of hanging just around. To elaborate a tiny bit more on that, Pete, this is more related to if you did have a data breach and then you f failed to notify the authorities, or failed to notify your customers of this breach, that's when you're, you're up for these fines. And ah, thank you. Been neglecting for a long time. That's why the Australian government put these in place. So, yep. Um, and I wanted to share. Thank you. That clarification is if you've not notified. Uh, if you've had data breaches and you're not notified, not not just if you've had a breach. Um, but th this article um, I I saw early this morning, and I and I wanted to share that um, uh, mandatory reporting of ransomware attacks um, is is basically a red hot red hot issue for the australian government uh, and so they're increasing these that that slide there was where they are currently um they're um you know they're being uh they're being increased here so i don't know exactly where uh you know what they're going to but um key issue key issue for the government uh, here we go uh 44 of companies that surveyed had no plan to stop data breaches originating from supply chain partners uh hold on, where was another one there was another uh yeah the country is 2.5 million small and medium-sized businesses were the engine room for the economy but largely unprepared for cyber crime um so pretty important so if you didn't grab that uh link before vapt dash offer if you would like to connect with us and have a free consultation uh you can just email us hit reply to any one of the emails that you received otherwise uh what's the best email to reach out to the team uh adrian it's uh, in inquiries at onsitehelper.com. Inquiries at onsitehelper.com. Okay, thanks. You can reach out to the team. Otherwise, there's a lead form on our website. You can click on that. Uh, thanks so much. That concludes our presentation. We're going to stay around uh, as long as anyone has any Q&A. You're welcome to drop that in now. Um, if you need to go, uh, that's totally fine. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, if you've got questions, we'll stay as long as there are questions. So thank you. Uh, we've got another one from Renee. I'll be, in cut I'll be in touch. This was great. Thank you so much, Renee. Uh, wonderful. And a uh, big thank you to Adrian and Max for helping me present. Thank you. I think uh, Cam and Ash are here from our marketing team. And I saw Stan as well, uh, who's our head of sales. Uh, so thank you to the on-site helper team uh, for helping us bring this together. And uh, we will give just another 10 seconds for any Q&A to come through. Uh, otherwise, we will wrap things up there. Uh, but thanks for joining.